Britain's cathedrals. Majestic, magnificent, monumental. For more than 1,400 years, they've dominated Britain's landscape. Never out of sight, never out of mind. Epic structures, they represent our history and the changing fortunes of a nation. I'm Tony Robinson, and in this series, I'll be exploring six of Britain's greatest cathedrals. What a privilege. Their stories of rivalry and royalty. Henry was determined to strip the church of its power. Of struggles and sacrifice. Who will rid me of this troublesome priest? Of martyrs and murder. And they just hacked him down right on the spot. Containing more than a thousand years of history, I'll discover how these buildings were constructed. Isn't that extraordinary? How they've evolved and what secrets they hold. For some buildings, you need a whole dictionary of superlatives, and Liverpool Cathedral is one of them. It's the Church of England's newest cathedral, as well as Britain's biggest. The bells inside are the highest and the heaviest. And in its day, it contained the largest musical instrument ever made. Built on a hill, it dominates the city's famous skyline. Unlike other stone-built medieval cathedrals, this one was constructed from steel and concrete and more than 11 million bricks. It's an enormous space, five times larger than the Royal Albert Hall. The story of our modern age has been cemented into the walls of this building and some of the major events of the last hundred years have been played out under its roof. Two world wars, national tragedies, as well as historic performances. Construction on the cathedral began in 1904, and despite all the interruptions, work never ceased. Not until it was finally completed in 1978, 74 years later. For generations, thousands of Liverpool men and women had worked on it tirelessly. It's a cathedral built by the city's people and for the city's people. From the outside, it's the immense tower that strikes you first. It soars 331 feet into the sky. That's more than 100 metres. Underneath it, there's a cavernous central space, with the altar at one end, the main entrance and the nave at the other. Although much younger, Liverpool's layout is similar to earlier counterparts like Canterbury and Salisbury. But inside, there are some major differences that you notice straight away. <laughs> For a start, it's so big. It's not like any other cathedral I've been to before. It's like a dance hall. And look, you can see straight through to the altar. There's nothing in the way at all. The nave leads to the awe-inspiring central space, the main body of the cathedral, with smaller chapels and memorials to the side. Next is the chancel, where the choir sits. Finally, the ornate altar, with a stunning stained-glass window towering above. Unlike medieval cathedrals, there's a real sense of space and openness here. The scale is stupendous, but it's not intimidating. It's actually rather welcoming. I feel at home already. The cathedral has always been a haven of quiet serenity. But when construction started, Liverpool and its port were the complete opposite. The early 20th century was a thrilling time for the city. Less than a mile away, the Mersey was buzzing, with liners taking passengers to America and back again. The most famous transatlantic ship of them all is still remembered in the cathedral to this day, etched into its very walls. There are so many details here that you wouldn't notice unless somebody pointed them out to you. For instance, 
that shield up there you wouldn't have spotted at all, would you, if it wasn't for that bright light? That's actually the Titanic, which, although it was built in Belfast, was actually registered in Liverpool, because that's where its owners, the White Star Line, were based. She was the pride of the seas. But on the fifth day of her maiden voyage in April 1912, the Titanic hit an iceberg and sank, with the loss of more than 1,500 lives. Many of the crew, along with the musicians who played on as she went down, were from Liverpool. As was her captain, Edward John Smith, who's also remembered in the cathedral. Six days after the disaster, they held a memorial service here for the tragedy that touched a nation and the city of Liverpool. The sinking of the Titanic is just one of many dramas from the 20th century connected to this immense cathedral. But how and why did it rise up in the first place? When building started, the city already had more than a hundred churches. So why did it need another one? To find the answer, we have to go back. In the mid-1700s, Liverpool was a small town of around 20,000 souls. By 1900, its population had exploded and it was a bustling metropolis of over a million people. The rapid growth was thanks to the trade generated by Liverpool's seven miles of docks. It handled more cargo than London or indeed any European port. This boom town officially became a city in 1880. For a while, the parish church of St Peter's served as its cathedral. But clearly it was too small for a place this size. Liverpool wanted a sprawling cathedral for a sprawling city. Cathedrals have always been at the cutting edge of construction technology. Statements of engineering genius as much as faith. Salisbury's 14th century spire is the tallest in Britain. 400 years later, St Paul's took construction design to new heights. Its dome is one of the highest in the world. Liverpool wanted to outdo London and Salisbury. They were thinking big, and they needed an architect with dreams to match. But who would deliver a mighty new cathedral worthy of this great city? And where would they get the money from? Liverpool Cathedral, a dominating edifice looking down on the banks of the River Mersey. A true 20th century masterpiece it's one of Britain's newest cathedrals. Today, it's an iconic feature of the Liverpool skyline. But over a hundred years ago, nobody knew what it would look like. To find the best architect to design it, a competition was announced. In the year 1901, the Diocese of Liverpool put this ad in the newspaper, the committee for the erection of the intended cathedral being desirous of obtaining designs for a cathedral in the Gothic style. Well, they got over a hundred responses to this ad. For architects up and down the country, this was the job of the century. Some of their original design entries are still held in the cathedral archives. I'm not sure I would have fancied being on the committee, making this awesome decision about which cathedral would dominate the skyline of Liverpool. This one is dull, isn't it? I don't even know why he bothered to draw it, to be quite honest. This one is quite intriguing with all these spires. Looks, looks a bit French, doesn't it? I think it would feel imported if you stuck that on a hill in Liverpool. Just as the advert demanded, these designs were Gothic inspired by the great cathedrals first seen in the 12th century. Among them all, one really stood out. This, I mean, this really is a cathedral. And yes, it, it does feel like it's in the tradition of all those other cathedrals that you see all over the place, but there's something modern about it as well. Remarkably, it was submitted by an architect's apprentice, who previously had hardly designed anything, certainly not a building. Just 21, his name was Giles Gilbert Scott. One of the judges said about uh, this drawing that it was power combined with beauty that makes a great and noble building. It's a nice thing to have said about something that you'd drawn, isn't it? 
I would definitely have gone for the, uh, the Gilbert Scott. Has a great deal of promise, this one, I think I'd have said. And perhaps that promise wasn't so surprising. Young Giles had been born into a dynasty of architects. His grandfather was the world-famous Sir George Gilbert Scott. His works spanned the British Empire. In England alone, he designed 800 buildings, including the Grand Midland Hotel, St Pancras Station and the Albert Memorial. But what of his grandson Giles? Well, before he won the cathedral competition, the only thing he'd ever designed was a pipe rack. Still, he had his admirers. One of the judges, George F. Bodley, passionately believed Giles' design to be the best. And to crush any concerns about the young winner's inexperience, Bodley agreed to be joint architect. This meant that both Giles and George would sign off on every single design for the whole cathedral, right down to the door handles. Intricate carvings would adorn the walls and elaborate stained glass windows would fill the space with colour. It was designed as a heavenly building, but it would cost the earth. The total build was estimated at £500,000. That's £50 million today. And none of that money was going to come from the Church of England. Liverpool Cathedral would have to rely on public donations. And those donations didn't all come at once. That meant it was never going to all be built at the same time. It would be piecemeal, a bit here, a bit there, as the money came in. But where would that money come from? Well, this is where we come to the dark part of the cathedral's history. A lot of it came from the profits from slavery. Liverpool grew incredibly rich as a result of the slave trade in the 18th century. The port was at the tip of a trade triangle involving three continents. Ships would sail from here to West Africa, carrying textiles, firearms and alcohol. Once they arrived, they'd exchange those goods for people. Those people were then transported to the Americas, where they were sold as slaves. Most of them were forced to work on plantations, producing sugar, cotton and other goods, which were sent back to ports like Liverpool and then re-exported all over the world, generating vast amounts of money for the merchants. And it was the families of those merchants who gave huge amounts for the building of Liverpool Cathedral. At the International Slavery Museum in Liverpool's Albert Dock, we can identify them. These are the major donors to Liverpool Cathedral. Were any of those involved yeah, with slavery? The Hurl family was a Liverpool family and very, very deeply um, involved in, in the trade. This is typically the kind of family who can, in one end, making money with slavery operation, sell them like animals and in the other end, give money to church. It's a kind of human paradox. Generations of the Earl family became mayors of Liverpool. They even had a street named after them. They were just one of several families whose involvement in slavery generated the wealth on which Liverpool was built. The Earl family's descendants, who inherited a dubious fortune, donated £25,000 to the cathedral. Not all donations were controversial, though. A wine merchant paid for the marble floor, a Somerset woman gave £800 for the font, and local children saved their pennies to pay for this porch at the Lady Chapel. It was the first part of the building to be finished in 1910, and services could be held here until the main cathedral was completed. It was a little gothic showpiece. This part of the cathedral is completely different. It's much lighter for a start, and I don't know, it's got a more delicate feel about it somehow, with lots and lots of little windows and this gorgeous fluted tracery on the ceilings. But before they could begin work on the rest of the cathedral, Scott's mentor, George Bodley, died, and Scott still relatively young and inexperienced, was given total control. 
With his newfound power, he took everyone by surprise. He ripped up the old plans and started again. He dropped all the ornate Gothic detail and swapped the two towers for one massive central tower instead. Now working on his own, Scott could fully realize his vision. It was a modern style for a modern age, and it called for modern ideas. Engineering what would eventually be Britain's largest cathedral required inspiration, and Scott found it in some of the big industrial buildings that were going up at the time. Factories, foundries and mills were created with the basic building block of the age, brick. Scott would go on to design his own giant structures, also in brick. Battersea Power Station and Bankside Power Station, today's Tate Modern. He also gave us another modern icon, the world-famous Red Phone Box. Such achievements would bring him a knighthood, but Liverpool Cathedral remained his life's masterwork. After Bodley's death, Scott's new, improved cathedral began to take shape. Money was flowing in, and a bright future for Liverpool and the cathedral beckoned. Then in 1914, calamity struck. Europe was rocked by the outbreak of war. A war which saw the slaughter of millions. This is the Roll of Honour. It lists every man in Liverpool who died in the First World War. There are thousands and thousands. There's one name, though, that stands out, Noel Chavas, who was closely connected with the cathedral. In fact, his dad, Francis, was the bishop here. Noel made military history as the only man in the First World War to win two Victoria Crosses, the country's highest award for bravery. But he wasn't a frontline soldier. He was an army doctor. In 1916, he was hit by a shell, rescuing troops stranded in no man's land. Noel stayed with them, treating their wounds overnight while bombs and sniper fire surrounded him. These heroics earned him his first Victoria Cross. And his proud dad said, so far, you have been known as the son of the Bishop of Liverpool. Henceforth, I will be known as the father of Captain Chavas. Just one year later, Noel was in the line of fire again at one of the war's bloodiest battles, Passchendaele. And again, he bravely went out into no man's land to rescue injured men. This time, he was seriously wounded himself. He kept going out into the battlefield, locating men, tending to them, and he saved many lives. But after two days, he was suffering from terrible pain, from bad stomach wounds, and he hadn't had anything to eat, and he agreed to have an emergency operation. But shortly after that, he died. For his selfless bravery and courage, he received his second Victoria Cross. He was just 32. As for the cathedral, the war had taken its toll in other ways. Materials, money and manpower dwindled. The building process slowed down, but it never stopped. The people of Liverpool were determined to get their cathedral no matter what. And in 1924, the partially finished building was actually ready to unveil its star attraction. Something that would turn a building site into a living, breathing cathedral. It was only fitting that Britain's biggest cathedral should house the world's biggest musical instrument. It's quite extraordinary. The sound's actually bouncing off the walls. Spine tingling, I think the word is. What's it like to play? It's phenomenal. The feeling of power is immense yeah. because, of course, the building is, is huge and they, they sculpted an organ to fit the size of the building. And so it is very, uh, at its loudest, uh, annihilatingly loud. The thrill is in mixing and matching and rather like a good cook in a kitchen, putting a little bit of herbs in here and spices mm. there. You can actually mix and match your own stops. A stop is one of these. Flutes. 
trumpets. And there's a massive trumpet up in the central space, 179 feet. That's the angels. Yes, it is indeed. Exactly. <laughs> it's as though the church itself is playing the music. Absolutely, yes, yes. What about keeping it in tune? It's a big job, yes. It takes 50 days a year maintenance, the organ, and there are 10,268 pipes, and they all react differently. Just say that number again. 10,268. This stupendous organ was first played in public when the royal family came to attend the official blessing of the cathedral. Thousands lined the road to glimpse King George V and Queen Mary arriving. But although they were royalty, that day in 1924 wasn't all about them. The royal family were 15 minutes early, and when he heard that, the bishop said that they would have to wait. As you can imagine, the royal equerries were incandescent. They said, damn it, man, the king cannot wait. And it was left to a priest to solve the problem as diplomatically as he could. He said, my lord, this service is not for the king. It's for God Almighty. And when he said that, the king and queen decided they would wait along with everyone else. As the people of Liverpool celebrated the birth of their new cathedral, little did they know that another world war was on its way. One where the city would find itself on the front line. But would its still unfinished cathedral survive? Liverpool Cathedral, built with over 11 million bricks and clad in stone. The First World War had slowed construction to a crawl, and by the end it was still only half built. Now that the war was over, and given the introduction of post-war technology, they could really get cracking. Instead of picks and shovels, pneumatic drills were used to dig the foundations. 300 tonnes of soil were dug out every day. 110 men poured 200 tonnes of concrete every 12 hours into the ground to make the foundations. Some builders had been there since the beginning. It was a family affair. These two brothers, the Rowbottoms, worked on the cathedral for 49 years. Over the decades, hundreds of workers set nearly five million bricks into the walls of the middle section alone. End to end, they would stretch from Liverpool to Berlin. And piled on top of each other, they'd reach 40 times the height of Everest. As donations rolled in, there was finally enough money to build Scott's great new tower. 300,000 pounds, equivalent to 11 million in today's money. The tower had to be tall and strong enough to house the world's heaviest set of bells, which Scott himself watched being cast. But it's customary to throw a silver sixpence for luck into the metal. This superstition is performed by Sir Giles Scott, the architect, so that now the tenor bell will strike a true and tuneful note. Bells would have to wait. 200 men had worked on this magnificent tower for five years. But in 1939, the total workforce on the entire cathedral dwindled to just 35. The rest had been called up to the armed forces. A second world war was underway, and the very future of this building hung in the balance. The biggest threat to the cathedral was the port. The trade that flowed through it had generated the money to build it, but now its existence was putting it at peril. Liverpool had the largest port on the west coast of Britain. A whopping 80% of the country's war supplies flowed through it. For the Nazis, it was the biggest target outside London. The cathedral had been built on a hill next to the port with a great big copper roof and a tall unfinished tower. It was the perfect target for the German bombers. They tried to make it less visible from the air by painting the roof black, and they covered some of the more vulnerable parts with sandbags, but it was impossible to completely protect such a big building. In preparation for the inevitable German bombers, 
Older cathedrals like Canterbury and York removed their medieval glass windows and hid them for safety. Meanwhile, in Liverpool, a fire watch was set up to look for blazes, and to protect the new cathedral, staff slept in the building overnight. They included the dean, Frederick Dwelly. He'd seen the cathedral grow up from the ground. He certainly wasn't going to abandon it now. He moved his bed and his wardrobe up to this little room, right under the flammable wooden ceiling of the Lady Chapel, much to the amusement of the choir boys, because this was their rehearsal room. On the 28th of August, 1940, 160 bombers appeared on the horizon. The terror had begun. The Liverpool Blitz lasted intermittently for 18 months. 10,000 homes were destroyed and more than 4,000 people lost their lives. Bombs narrowly missed the cathedral, blowing off doors and shattering windows. Millie Siddall, her three-year-old daughter, and husband George, an engineer at the cathedral, lived here on Washington Street, just next door to it. On the 5th of September, 1940, their house took a direct hit and they were all killed. Despite all the death and destruction, the cathedral carried on holding services. This is from the Sunday service sheet for October the 6th, 1940. It says, just before the list of hymns. If an air raid warning sounds during a service, the act of worship will be immediately transferred to the crypt where the service will be continued. Nothing was going to stop the people of Liverpool from worshipping in their cathedral. In November 1940, George VI and his wife, Queen Elizabeth, our Queen Mother, visited the battered city and its cathedral. The king said to the dean, keep going, whatever you do, even if you can only go on in a small way. Meanwhile, the cathedral remained in the firing line. Every part of it was battered with bombs. A couple of small high explosives went off around here, leaving thousands of incisions in the walls. There were bombs bouncing off the roof and exploding in mid-air. But miraculously, the wind blew the flames away and the cathedral survived, a beacon of hope among all the carnage. The last German air raid took place on the 10th of January, 1942 by which time Liverpool was the most heavily bombed area of the country outside the capital. When the Prime Minister Winston Churchill visited, he said, I see the damage done by the enemy attacks, but I also see the spirit of an unconquered people. Every day at noon, a bell is rung in the cathedral. It's from HMS Liverpool, a World War II warship. The ceremony is in remembrance of all those sailors who lost their lives in one of the most important but least known campaigns of that war, the Battle of the Atlantic. Max Horton was a lay preacher at the cathedral, as well as a commander in the British Royal Navy. There was a new and grave danger out at sea, and it was up to him to tackle it. As an island nation, Britain needed more than a million tonnes of imported goods a week just to survive and fight. If the war was to be won, Liverpool's port would be vital in keeping this flow of men and supplies between North America and Europe. And Germany knew that all too well. Up to four convoys a week, each with as many as 60 ships, would race across the Atlantic to Liverpool, bearing vital troops and supplies, and running a deadly gauntlet of Nazi submarines which would hunt for them in packs. These wolf packs, as they were known, were hugely successful. Between January and July 1942, they sank nearly 400 Allied ships. The losses were so damaging that Britain was only weeks away from running out of food. Churchill later said, the only thing that really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. It was time for Max Horton to take centre stage. 
Horton had been a submarine commander and he devised this brilliant strategy which not only changed the course of the Battle of the Atlantic but ultimately helped the Allies win the war. He formulated it here in a secret underground bunker just a mile away from the cathedral. Bomb-proof and gas-proof, it had a seven-foot-thick roof and walls that were three feet deep. Known as the Citadel, this complex of over 100 rooms covered 50,000 square feet. How did the U-boats get into the convoys? There wasn't a steel ring around the convoy, so the U-boats would literally just slip in and then start taking pot shots at the boats that were in the convoy. So what did Max do which transformed that situation? They went out and hunted the U-boats down. And that was a risk, you have to remember. These boats were leaving the convoy and not protecting them anymore. They were going out to try and find the U-boats and force the U-boats to the surface. And then quite often they would use their own boats to ram them. It was very visceral warfare. Presumably this must have had a knock-on effect to the preparations for D-Day. Yeah, Roosevelt said, if we don't win the war in the Atlantic, we won't win the war full stop. So Horton was fundamental to us winning the war because he provided a lot of the means for us being able to conduct D-Day successfully. That's what I think, certainly, yes. He was, he was critical, unsung hero of the Second World War. By night, Admiral Max Horton worked in this secret bunker, but by day, he preached and prayed at the cathedral for the survival of the free world. Horton was very keen that the men under his command should use this cathedral as their parish church. He came here a lot and actually took part in the services and eventually became a great friend of the Dean, who in 1945 wrote him this letter. My dear Admiral, it means more than you can imagine that you should take the leading part on these occasions. For well we know that we owe our very life as an island to the unconquerable resolve that you, sir, have inspired, impelled and compelled. Battered and bruised but not beaten, the construction of the cathedral resumed apace following the war. The great tower was completed and could now fulfil its purpose. Thirteen bells, the biggest, heavier than Big Ben, were moulded and brought here on vast trucks. And the biggest of them all was wheeled in on specially laid tracks. Weighing in at 14 tonnes, it was called the Borden Bell, or Great George after the King. A team of 12 men hauled it 200 feet up into the belfry at a rate of just four inches per minute. It was backbreaking work. Finally, after 10 hours, Great George was ready to be hung but there was one more challenge to overcome. The problem was that the 31-ton weight of these bells could force the walls outwards and cause them to collapse. The solution was to hang them in a way no other cathedral had done before. Instead of a timber frame, this ring of reinforced concrete supported by massive steel girders takes the enormous weight, allowing the tower to stand firm. Len Mitchell's been ringing bells here since the 60s. How do the bells work? Uh, well, we pull on a rope from the ringing chamber, which currently is below us, and then uh, the rope comes up through from the ringing chamber and around this wheel, so that when we pull on that rope, the whole thing goes over. So it's really exactly the same as they do in the medieval cathedral? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, indeed. Uh, slightly more controlled fashion here, because we leave these bells in what's called the up position, and we're able to very precisely determine when that bell goes ding. They were first rung together in 1951 for the visit of the Princess Elizabeth and her husband, Prince Philip. They owe their beautiful sound to what's inside each of them, a clapper. What's that, that old clapper over there? Well, this is an example of a, uh, an old style clapper. This particular one, um, is made out of wrought iron. The mechanism would be that there would be a, a, a hinge pin on the inside of the bell, and then the clapper would swing from it like that, and yeah. then eventually hit the side of the bell to make the noise. This bit in there is a piece of leather, um, and in fact, that goes by the name of a leather baldric. Really? Indeed. Look, <laughs> there is the real baldric. <laughs> <laughs> The installation of the bells in 1951 meant the cathedral was now edging towards completion. 
But that landmark would come too late for one man, its architect, Giles Gilbert Scott. He died in 1960, age 79. Scott's buried here with his wife next to the cathedral. He couldn't be buried inside it because he was a Roman Catholic. He spent the whole of his adult life building this massive monument, but like the great medieval cathedral builders, he never lived to see it finished. In 1978, Liverpool and the whole country did see it finished. But with the most modern materials and using the most modern techniques, what could possibly go wrong? Well, quite a lot, actually. Liverpool, 1978. The largest cathedral in Britain opened its doors 74 years after the foundation stone was laid. It had taken a lifetime to construct. Its builders and bishops had kept the faith when money and materials were scarce. And despite nearly being bombed into oblivion, it had remained a defiant beacon of hope. Now, finally, it could be admired in all its glory. The Queen came to the opening service where the words of the founding bishop, Francis Chavas, were read. He said, the new cathedral of Liverpool shall be built by all and for all. Where rich and poor meet together, it must be the best we can give. Well, it is pretty good, isn't it? But almost as soon as it was officially finished, the cracks began to show, literally. This is the part of the cathedral where the public aren't allowed to go, which I think is a great pity, because for my money, it's one of the most interesting parts. You see these massive brick walls, so they support the roof, and below me, as they get into the main bit of the church, they become great arches and columns. But building with bricks had a fatal flaw. In Scott's day, the mortar used to bind them wasn't flexible. If the building moved ever so slightly, the rigid brick walls couldn't move with it. And that caused the outer stone cladding to crack. Some believe that Scott, that most modern of cathedral architects, could have learnt a thing or two from his much earlier predecessors. Well, if this was built with the medieval material, lime, wouldn't have half of the problems that this cathedral's got. Why is that? Well, it's structurally too rigid. Whereas if it were a medieval cathedral, it were built with lime mortar, which naturally allows expansion. And that's why a lot of our medieval cathedrals are still stood there. When you're constructing something, there's differential movement between the different materials you're using. So no expansion, that's gonna go. And in a medieval cathedral, you'll have that, but the lime, works with it but this hasn't got any of that and in one way i'm glad because it's keeping me in work <laughs> by the time the queen the head of the anglican church opened this building in 1978 liverpool had welcomed a new catholic cathedral just a stone's throw away soon afterwards people of both religions prepared to welcome a very special visitor in 1982 Pope John Paul II visited Britain. This broke with nearly 2,000 years of tradition. No pope had ever been to this country before. And the last place anyone expected to see him was in a Church of England cathedral. After all, the Church of England owed its very existence to a bitter split from Rome, caused when Henry VIII demanded a divorce in defiance of the pope's orders. But 450 years on, that pope's successor, John Paul II, was intent on healing those ancient wounds. And on this momentous visit, he chose to come to Liverpool's mighty Anglican cathedral. A million people lined his route, and once inside, he said a prayer. Liverpool's Church of England cathedral was such a draw that even popes wanted to come here. But now, its role in the city grew even more. For Liverpudlians, it wasn't just a place for popes and processions. It was somewhere that ordinary people could live, celebrate and mourn as one. Never was that morning greater than on the 15th of April, 1989. 
That day, Liverpool FC lined up for one of the biggest matches of the season, the FA Cup semi-final against Nottingham Forest at Hillsborough Stadium, Sheffield. But within seven minutes, the game had to be abandoned. Poor police control had resulted in dangerous overcrowding in the Leppings Lane end of the stadium. There was a deadly crush. Britain's worst sporting disaster. 96 supporters lost their lives, the youngest just 10 years old. The disaster led to an outpouring of grief throughout the whole city. The cathedral opened its doors and a fortnight later it held a memorial service. Ever since, there's been an annual service here where friends and family can come and remember the dead inscribed in this book of remembrance. Football is one of the great enduring passions in Liverpool. Another is music. Not surprising when you think of all the great bands that have come from here. And of course there are none greater than the Beatles. As a student, John Lennon lived in the shadow of the cathedral. And as a schoolboy in the 1950s, Paul McCartney failed his audition for the choir. But in the 1990s, he returned to work with organist Ian Tracy and the choir to perform his first classical work, the Liverpool Oratorio. What was it like working with a Beatle? Terrific, actually, because I was a Beatle child. I went to see all their films, I had all their records, and to me, it was like meeting an idol, a childhood idol. And... How did it work creating it with Paul? Because he doesn't read music, does he? No. He's always reckoned that was in some way inhibiting to creativity. And he has a tune and he can sing tunes, and his tunes are real earwigs. You just can't shake them off. That's been his great success. That was a non-religious event in what's essentially a religious space, wasn't it? Does that happen very much? It does indeed, because the sacred and the secular are not poles apart, as people tend to think. And the building is used for all sorts of things, school speech days, degree days, dinner parties, concerts, and the oratory was merely one of them. You know, um, part of our thing is to try and involve ourselves in the community. Liverpool Cathedral was raised f by the people of Liverpool, for the people of Liverpool, and basically our ethos is to hold God before the city and the city before God. Today, this great cathedral sits proudly above the city, as if keeping an eye on the people who built it and who continue to find peace in it. Liverpool is one of Britain's most modern cathedrals, but it still continues to uphold the traditions of the past and is a monument to our history. This magnificent building remains central to the lives of Liverpool's community. It's where they come to celebrate and mourn, and to this day, it remains the pride of Liverpool.